This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I am Amy Goodman. We are broadcasting from the UN Climate Summit in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. Tens of thousands of delegates have come here to Sharm el-Sheikh to attend the COP27 UN Climate Conference. The summit's taking place under the most repressive regime in the history of the modern Egyptian state. Over the past decade, there's been an unprecedented crackdown on human rights, on civil society, on the media, on environmental activism, and much more. Tens of thousands of political prisoners are behind bars, the most prominent of which is the technologist, the activist, the writer, Ala Abdel Fattah, whose case has become a lightning rod here at the summit and who just ended a more than seven-month-long hunger strike. Meanwhile, outside Sharm, in Cairo and cities across Egypt, security forces have launched a widespread crackdown in the days leading up to and during the summit. Hundreds have been arrested. Security forces have locked down the streets, stopping random passersby, forcibly searching for content on their phones. Lawyers and journalists have been detained, including most recently the journalist Ahmed Fayez, who was arrested after posting that al Abdel Fattah had been subject to a forced medical intervention. The Egyptian government, meanwhile, continues to tout its role as the host country of COP27 has been working to bolster its international legitimacy through the summit. For more on the human rights situation in Egypt and much more, we're joined by Hossam Bakhet, executive director and founder of the Egyptian Initiative for Human Rights one of the country's leading human rights groups. He's also worked as an investigative journalist for the independent media outlet Maramasa. Over the years, Hossam Vahyat has been targeted by the government for his work. For the past seven years, he's been banned from traveling outside Egypt and had his personal assets frozen. In 2015, he was arrested and held for several days while under investigation by the military prosecutor before he was released following international outcry. Hossam Bakhet, it's wonderful to have you back on Democracy Now!, but today we are in your country, we are in Egypt, though Sharm el-Sheikh doesn't exactly feel like uh, the rest of Egypt, is that right? Can you talk about the significance of this climate summit? Um, in this climate of fear for Egyptians outside this resort city? Now, uh, of course, <clears throat> um, it doesn't um, really represent uh, the rest of the country in normal times, uh, but especially <clears throat> during these two weeks, um, there is um, a certain degree of uh, freedom, uh, at least inside the UN zone, the so-called uh, blue zone, uh, where Egyptians uh, ha can, for the first time in many years, express their views, hold public debates, uh, speak freely to the media, uh, but also interact with um, civil society and climate justice activists from all over the world uh, without fear of um, uh, prompt, instant um, reprisal, but of course with the fear of reprisal after COP on everyone's mind. But, and how does it feel for you here in Sharm el-Sheikh? I mean, you are banned from leaving Egypt. This must be such an unusual experience to meet with people around the world. Uh, definitely. I mean, it's uh, it's like really traveling to another country, um, except um, the world sort of came to Egypt uh, for these two weeks. Um, that, that it's not just the kind of access that we have to official delegations, uh, but the con kind of connectedness um, and um, rebuilding of relationships and building of future uh, partnerships. Um, around um, the issues of human rights and climate justice and environmental justice. But most importantly, it is being able to breathe, um, really, because uh, COP brought with it um, uh, this um, level of oxygen uh, that Egypt um, has been lacking for the past eight years. So let's talk about what's happened through this period. I mean, in Sharm el-Sheikh, um, uh, you have the climate summit. But in Cairo, people are being picked off the streets. You have the story of the journalist who reported on um, Ala Abdel Fattah's medical condition being arrested among, well, we have reports of hundreds of people arrested among the 
tens of thousands who are imprisoned right now. Yeah, I mean, th this is just one glimpse, really, of what happens on a daily basis in Egypt, and it goes to show um, in uh, very clear terms how what's happening within the blue zone in Sharm el-Sheikh uh, has not really uh, stopped or uh, changed the behavior of the Egyptian government um, um, in other cities, and especially in Cairo. There was a call for protests um, that came from um, opposition figures in the diaspora living in exile, um, marked at 11, the 11th of November, uh, to Last coincide. Last Friday, 11-11. Correct. Um, to before, I mean, to, to coincide with with um, uh, COP, and of course, be before um, the government of Egypt reacted in the typical uh, paranoid and excessive way. So for many weeks, uh, security was everywhere on the streets. Um, we saw the return of uh, random stops and arrests, um, the illegal searching of uh, mobile phones, looking for um, not just any um, uh, critical posts, uh, but really whether the person had even liked um, or shared a critical post or had any interest in politics at all. Um, the um, uh, tally kept by independent human rights organizations uh, from October till mid-November, till yesterday, uh, is over 600 people arrested. About 40 of them <coughs> have not reappeared yet, so are still uh, forcibly disappeared, and including around 24 women. And yet you did not support a boycott of the summit. Why? Uh, when Egypt was first uh, declared uh, as the host of COP27 uh, late last year, there, was, there were some calls, especially from outside of Egypt, uh, for campaigning to relocate or reconsider that decision. Uh, we disagreed with um, these calls. And then there were calls on activists to boycott uh, this summit. And again, we disagreed and actually urged activists from around the world to use this opportunity to come to Egypt. Egypt has not allowed um, international human rights organizations or independent uh, social justice activists to come into the country uh, since at least 2014. Um, organizations like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch came to Egypt this week for the first time in nine years. Uh, so. Um, it's not just um, this lifeline of support um, that we needed, but also a global spotlight um, that was, um, uh, you know, uh, put on Egypt uh, for a few weeks before and the two weeks of the COP uh, that we haven't had in a number of years. Because as you know, you know, Egypt is only in the news when there is a crisis. And from the outside, Egypt appears to be a stable country in a very unstable region. And there's a degree of normalization with the level of abuse in Egypt, a story that says that the Egyptian regime arrested dissidents is old news, unfortunately. It doesn't capture the world attention anymore. And it became even um, more difficult after the war in Ukraine. The world had forgotten about Egypt. So this is really a, um, an important opportunity for us to be back in the spotlight, to use this opportunity to highlight the magnitude of the human rights crisis in the country and mobilize solidarity around it. And just to be clear, when you talk about Human Rights Watch being allowed back into the country, yet you have all of these hundreds of websites that Egyptians um, are blocked from accessing. Can you explain that? For example, even like WhatsApp. Yeah, I mean, since um, around 2017, the government uh, uh, decided to really uh, block any independent website that carried any uh, critical uh, views or information about Egypt. The problem is not just um, foreign websites uh, like uh, Human Rights Watch and uh, Al Hurra and Reporters Without Borders. The problem is that this blackout targeted 100% of independent Egyptian media outlets. 
So the number of news organizations that are Egyptian, that um, are reporting news from Egypt, that are available to the Egyptian people is now zero. People have to, uh, you know, download VPN in order to access these websites. So the government simply went around and blocked around 400 VPN websites so that Egyptian readers do not even have the app to download in order to access these um, news organizations. Uh, the number of blocked websites uh, so far is over 600, um, and all of them are blocked illegally, so not according to Egypt's abusive laws even, or any legal regulation. Uh, it's just uh, security authorities that decide to pull the plug on any media organization or human rights organization that carries critical views. Um you know, Hassan Bakat, I introduced you as a leading human rights advocate, but you are perhaps the leading investigative journalist in Egypt. And I wanted um, the camera to go to the two shot right now um, and look across the room from us. We're right outside the plenary. Right across from us, um, it says UMS, and you've got the UN Climate Summit logo, um, and you've got men who've been sitting there all day. You did an investigation of how the Egyptian military, uh, through um, a private equity group, bought up most of the media in Egypt. Can you explain what we're looking at here? Yeah. I mean, um UMS stands for United Media Services. Uh, this is a company um, that was established by Egypt's uh, General Intelligence Service uh, for the sole purpose of purchasing all privately owned um, TV stations, newspapers, and uh, news websites. Um, of course, uh, anyone familiar with Egypt, even under the autocratic rule of Mubarak, remembers that um, despite the limits on freedom of expression and uh, free media, uh, Egypt had a vibrant media scene through uh, privately owned um, independent uh, journalism uh, that um, really um, led Egypt to stand out uh, even uh, within the Middle East uh, for its uh, level of accountability, uh, journalism, and independent reporting. Uh, shortly after President Sisi came to power, he started openly complaining uh, about two things, about uh, critical or opposition voices expressed in the media, or, and, and also about the hours of political talk show uh, every night that Egyptians turn to religiously every evening to follow the news and to learn um, about what's happening in the country. Uh, and so uh, the intelligence service simply went to one media outlet after the other and um, bought it over. And then all of uh, the media of the country is now um, under this UMS, United Media Services, or Al Muttahida. Um, and that has really turned Egypt within four years into, you know, Uzbekistan, Belarus, Syria under Assad, where the headlines of every newspaper are the same. There is one news bulletin that is read out in every TV station, and there isn't a single opposition newspaper or even column in Egypt now. When you did the expose and the military takeover of the media, what happened to you when you did it from Adamasar? Um, I got in trouble before that one for other uh, investigations that also looked into um, uh, the military and security establishment uh, takeover of the state, really, state capture by security agencies, if you want. Um, and then when we, uh, when I got into uh, looking at this uh, secret media acquisition, uh, of course, our website was blocked, and then it was repeatedly blocked every time we relaunched it. And then eventually, the government went public, and it it's actually now a well-known fact that um, United Media Services is owned by General Intelligence. They take pride even in that fact. How did you get accreditation, Hossam, to this UN Climate Summit? There were others, even uh, foreign human rights activists, that got uh, even accreditation and were denied entry here. How did you get to come here? 
believe me, it wasn't easy. Um, so, uh, you know, all Egyptian organizations had to apply for a special permit to come for this COP only um, and to apply to the Egyptian COP presidency, the Egyptian foreign ministry. Uh, so we couldn't apply directly to the UN. Uh, for, uh, for observer status. Uh, the Egyptian government kept uh, that process uh, secret. The very existence of that process was never announced, and then went around and hand-picked, uh, effectively pre-selected, uh, the Egyptian organizations to invite. And then <clears throat> um, all the names of human rights organizations that sought to receive this one-time accreditation were rejected. Uh, so ultimately, the Egyptian government picked um, around 30 odd um, um, civil society organizations, um, and the number of human rights groups on that list was zero. Um, so what we had to do is, um, of course, go around to uh, partners in international organizations that have observer status from the UN and ask them to include us in their delegation. So I'm not here representing an Egyptian human rights organization, my organization. Uh, I um, got here. Uh, with a badge from a German climate group uh, called German Zero, and I thank them very much. Uh, but without them, really, I would not have been here. And the same is true for any Egyptian human rights defender who is on the ground in Sharm el-Sheikh this week. Well, Hossam Bakat, there is someone uh, who is not here on the ground, though, uh, as a number of people said, should be the main person addressing world leaders, and that is Allah, Abda Allah um, uh, al Fatah. And he is a leading political activist back to the. Um, Tahrir uh, to the Arab Spring. He's been in prison for most of the last 10 years. Now, one world leader after another has come here. Um, the German chancellor uh, has called on Sisi, uh, the president of Egypt, to free him. Macron, the president of France, did it through AFP, Agence France Presse. Um, what about President Biden? He was here on 11-11. He was here on uh, Friday for a couple of hours with a large delegation uh, with Nancy Pelosi and others, the House Speaker. Um, can you talk about what the U.S. is demanding uh, in terms of Allah, who's just finished a seven-month hunger fast? Um, and what that meeting between Sisi and Biden was, what we understand, did Biden make any demands, call for his release, his freedom? He is a British-Egyptian human rights leader. Um, to our knowledge, there isn't really um, a single head of state or government uh, that came to um, COP um, and uh, had a bilateral meeting with President Sisi uh, that didn't raise the case of political prisoners in general and Ala Abdel Fattah in particular, because of course um, uh, Ala's case became much more critical just before COP because a week before he went on a full hunger strike, after, as you say, seven months of a partial hunger strike, and then on Including the Including drinking no water for On six the very days. first day of the summit, uh, he stopped drinking water. And um, uh, so that, of course, became uh, the most urgent, most uh, critical case. And um, our understanding is that uh, President Biden, as well as uh, several members, uh, senior members of um, his delegation uh, raised uh, the case of Ale with their counterparts. Um, unfortunately, the um, um, Egyptian government uh, has not only resisted all these calls for Ale to be released um, or uh, deported to the UK, but also have kept him um, um, with absolutely no contact with the outside world for the last uh, two weeks until we got the very first note from him yesterday with proof of life uh, saying that he started drinking water. Um, and then today we got the uh, letter uh, that you read out that says he has ended his, his strike. Uh, so, of course, we're very relieved about that. Um, but as you say, Ala is only one of uh, many thousands of other political prisoners um, that um, uh, are in jail in open-ended um, pretrial detention or have been convicted uh, simply for having expressed dissenting views 
or exercise the peaceful activism. Do you know what's going to happen? His family, his sister and mother are expected to visit. I don't know if it's one or two who can go into the prison for the first time in a, quite a while on Thursday. His birthday is Friday. He's asked for a birthday cake. May have news for them. But in fact, last week, the lawyer was told he could go visit him. He was denied. He went back. He went back. He was denied. Um, and what role do international leaders play when it comes to this? I mean, the U.S. gives billions of dollars of military aid to Egypt, so whatever Biden said behind closed doors makes an enormous difference. The U.S. has enormous power, as do other Western countries. Uh, absolutely, and um, a, 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 you know we're all anxiously waiting for Thursday um, because this will be the first time that Taale uh, will have been seen uh, since October 31st, uh, the last uh, visit. Um, as you said, um, his lawyer three times received official permit uh, to visit him, and three times was turned away. Um, it is um, um, our um, speculation uh, that perhaps. Uh, prison authorities and security agencies uh, did not want Ale to be seen uh, in a very weak state um, after uh, all these um, weeks and months uh, of strike, especially because they have been repeatedly lying on the record, saying that Ale was not striking at all. Uh, so I think they were buying time, maybe, um, uh, until Ale maybe regains uh, some health and strength before they allow him to be seen by anyone. Um, of course, um, the United States um, uh, is an influential uh, country in the world, and especially so when it comes to Egypt, um, uh, given not just the military uh, support, uh, but you know a strategic um, and, and long relationship. Um, and um, the Egyptian regime in the past uh, two years has actually shown some sensitivity to uh, outside criticism um, and an effort to improve its image, um, perhaps in the lead up to the COP, uh, and you know, have taken some positive uh, signals to the outside world in terms of <coughs> releasing some political prisoners or the recent call for a national dialogue with the opposition. Uh, that goes to show, really, that the sustained engagement with the Egyptian government in public and private about its catastrophic human rights record can actually lead to some change. Can you talk about the American style, I think that's how the Egyptian government refers to it, prisons that Sisi has built. Uh, in fact, he referred to what you're just saying in his meeting with Biden when the press gaggle came out. Uh, he was the first to raise human rights, as if to um, uh, preempt something that Biden could say. But what these prisons are, like where Allah is held, um, what the president called um, American-style uh, prisons, um, I, I mean, I think when the president said it, uh, he thought it was a good thing. Uh, and in his mind, uh, he was perhaps re prefer referring to uh, the size of the prison uh, complex and uh, uh, the fact that it was maybe better maintained uh, compared to Egypt's um, very old and uh, crowded uh, prisons. But as the case of Ale and countless others uh, came to show us, these two shiny prisons continued to act with the same utter disregard for the rule of law, um, openly violating Egypt's own prison regulations, refusing to implement um, permits, visiting permits uh, issued by the country's top public prosecutor and denying Ale the most uh, basic uh, rights. Ale, in his letter today, is celebrating, announcing to his family that they allowed an MP3 player in. This is the first time in three years that Ale will be allowed to listen to music. And that's unlike every other prisoner in that prison. You know, for three years, Ale was campaigning for the prison authorities to pick any book of their choosing from the prison library to allow him to read. Mm. For three years, he was not allowed to read a book, to listen to music, to have a radio, to get out of his cell. And that just goes to show you how vindictive this state is and how adamant they were at breaking him. But he stood and stood strong and actually, um, you know, managed 
um, to, to stay not just alive, but incredibly lucid and in very high spirits. Compare Egypt today with Egypt uh, that he and so many others um, protested 10 years ago, uh, the Arab Spring, what happened in Tahrir, what that meant not only for Egypt, but for the world. What happened in this 10 years? Uh, what, ha what has Sisi brought this country to? I mean, uh, back then, um, and, and of course you covered it extensively, under Mubarak we worked and organized um, because, of course, it was a country with a very troubling human rights um, uh, record. Uh, there were ongoing violations, some of them systemic, with impunity and, um, you know, a, a complete failure of accountability. Uh, but it was, you know, an authoritarian country that, and we were fighting for democracy. What we have right now is a full-scale human rights crisis uh, that made Egypt really, as I said, you know, uh, in, in the same state as, you know, Belarus and Uzbekistan and other countries, where it's not just that uh, human rights violations are rampant, but that we have a regime that became one of the worst abusers of human rights in the whole world. And that's not an emotional statement. If you uh, look up any independent ranking of uh, countries around the world on any measure of human rights, uh, you know, you will find Egypt among the worst three or five violators. Look at the number of journalists in prison. We're number three in the world after Turkey and China. Last year, we were number one in the world in terms of the number of death sentences, number three in terms of the number of actually carried out executions, the sheer population of political prisoners, the number of blocked websites, the number of, um, you know, the, the almost non-existing um, media sphere, and the full criminalization of uh, human rights work, where every human rights defender is facing uh, criminal charges, asset freezes, travel bans, not just myself. Uh, and where engaging in any act of peaceful opposition uh, has become grounds for imprisonment with no future of release. So my last question is what makes you so brave and what gives you hope? I mean, the UN Climate Summit ends this week. That is a level of protection that you and other people in civil society will not have. The level to which you are speaking out right now, you can't leave Egypt. What could happen to you now? I mean, we knew that we were uh, that we had to take a risk, uh, of course, um, and we always knew that it was only a two-week conference. That, so ultimately, it will be over, and we will all be back in Cairo. But it was really a choice between, um, you know, uh, not doing anything and wasting this uh, huge opportunity of having a UN summit on Egyptian soil, uh, or taking that risk. Uh, and facing possible consequences afterwards. Uh, initially, we decided to take that risk, that it was worth it. And then with Alaa's hunger strike, of course, um, you know, we lost any hesitation or fear. And we decided that, you know, we did not just have an opportunity, but an obligation to use this opportunity to tell our story. We hope that the world is not going to forget about Egypt once the COP is over. And um, so this uh, spotlight goes elsewhere, uh, but even if that happens, um, it will have been well worth it. Hassan Bakat, uh, all the best to you, founder and executive director of the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights, the IPR, based in Cairo. He's also worked as an investigative journalist for the independent media outlet Maramasar. For the past seven years, he's been banned from traveling outside Egypt and had his personal assets frozen. Thanks so much. Coming up, we speak to one of the most prominent climate activists in the world, Vanessa Nakate of Uganda. Stay with us.